بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أنبياء الله جميعا وعلى سيدهم وخاتمهم حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الذين إن مكناهم في الأرض أقاموا الصلاة وآتوا الزكاة وأمروا بالمعروف ونهوا عن المنكر ولله عاقبة الأمور Inspire your hearts and minds with a loud salawat for Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <clears throat> Why do we find many human communities and societies, including some Muslim societies today, are plagued by internal rift? internal conflict, division. Why the Muslims in particular are divided? Why they do not know how to work together, how to help each other, how to support each other? Why to, today we find in many Muslim areas, many Muslim countries, many Muslim societies, they are suffering because of war. And it's not a war that is waged against them by foreigners, but by some other Muslims, by some neighbors. Doesn't God say in the Quran, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas? We made you the best nation. You are supposed to be a role model for nas, for mankind. Doesn't God say in the Quran, <clears throat> Inna hadihi ummatukum ummatan wahida. This community, this nation has to be united. They have to be together. They have to support each other. Where is these principles gone? And what is the reason for this division? Some sociologists, psychologists, and ethicists, ulama al akhlaq they contend that humans by nature, they are prone to deficiencies. They are fragile, vulnerable. And this is a theory in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِيفَ Mankind have been created weak. They are fragile, susceptible to be broken, to be hurt, to be divided. And the only thing that keeps us strong, the only thing that infuses us with hope, with energy, is connection with God. It's religion and faith. Some people ask, what is the benefit of religion? Tell me how religion is helping you. Can you convince me so I can follow your religion? How does it help you? Does it help you to be rich? Does it help you to be famous? Does it help you to be a celebrity? 
Does it help you to buy a big house? No, not necessarily. There are many religious people, they don't have big house. They are not celebrities. They don't have big income, but they have big hearts. They are satisfied in their life. They are happy with their life because religion provides satisfaction and peace. God says about religion, Ala bidhikrillahi tatma'innu al-qulub. It is only with the remembrance of God, with relationship with God, with the <clears throat> worshipping of God, with the friendship with God, you can find peace and stability. You would not work for division. You will be a harmonious community. Today my subject is about the righteous citizen. Not the righteous citizens of Canada or America alone, but the righteous citizens of God's kingdom on this earth. The earth, the entire earth is God's kingdom. Wherever you go belongs to God. He's the superpower. So how to become righteous citizens? How to bring peace and stability and harmony in our societies, in our life? God says it through connection with me. Nowadays, more and more people, especially the young generation, are suffering from depression, anxiety, worry, stress, uncertain future, sadness. Many of them are breaking down. Many in the young generation, many of our youth, they survive on the drugs. Sometimes they can't sleep the night. They have a sleepless nights. I read a survey that only in America, 78 people, 78% of the people in America, they survive on sleeping pills. Can you imagine? 78%. At some point in their life, they have to take sleeping pills. Because they are worried about their future about their present, about their income, about their homes, about their families, about their partners, about their children. So where do we find peace then? Did God design this universe for us, this earth for us, so we always live worried, anxious? We live in anxiety and depression? This is not God's design for the humanity. God says, I want you to enjoy this life. Enjoy this life. Enjoy the natural resources of this life. Enjoy your humanity in this life. But where is it then? There was a survey just five days ago in the New York Times. The title of the survey is that it says 2017 was a rough year for the humanity. 2017 was a rough year for the humanity. When you go home, read this survey. This survey was conducted by Gallup. And they made this survey in 145 countries. They interviewed thousands and thousands of men and women. Different categories, different status. Different nations, different cultures. They come up with this survey that 2017 was a year of sadness, anxiety, and fear for so many people and for so many reasons. And this is a true. We can see it. We can see it in some, some of our young generation, including Muslim communities, including Muslim families. They are not exempt from this. They are part of the larger society. And the survey says those people are experiencing are going through negative experiences in their life some of them say we are worried about our future about our school about our graduation about whether we're going to get a job even those who have jobs they are worried that one day they would be laid off they lose their jobs they can't afford their mortgages they can't sustain their families so there are different reasons for that. More and more people are living 
anxious nowadays. God said, I have a very simple but very incredible and effective pres prescription for you. And that prescription is called faith, connection with God. الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَطْمَئِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ أَلَا Only. أَلَا means only. The only exception. The only way you find peace, peace of mind, you go to bed, you are not worried. Though you are not the richest, and maybe your bank account's balance is zero, but still you can sleep. You can enjoy your day, you can enjoy your night, you can enjoy your family. Because you have a trust in God, you have faith in God, you have good relationship with God. You don't take advantage of God. You are not a seasonal believer in God. Some people are seasonal believers, meaning that only in Ramadan he knows God. Outside Ramadan, he's disconnected. Only certain days of the week, certain days of the month, he connects with God. Other times he's disconnected. But if you are always with God, through good and bad, God is going to take care of you. It's only faith that is going to infuse you with, with hope, with salvation. Only faith. And I'm saying this, I'm addressing the young generation. I know sometimes you are stressed out because of your school, because of the circum circumstances, because of peer pressure around you. I know it's difficult because of uncertainties. You don't know what's going to happen, who you're going to marry, who you're going to work with, where you're going to live. Definitely these are worries. But when you have a guardian above you, when there is a loyal God, faithful God, who never turns his back to you. When you say to him, Ilahi Rabbi, he says, Labbayka Abdi. Tell me. Musa alayhi salam one day said to God when he went to the Mount Sinai to speak to him. He said to him, Ilahi hal anta ba'idun fa'unadik? Are you too far from me so I have to raise my voice? Am anta qareebun fa'unadik? Or you are close to me, so I whisper to you. God said to him, this is a general rule. God said to him, Ya Musa, ana jalisu man dhakarani. Whenever you remember me, I'm next to you immediately. You don't have to raise your voice. You don't even have to speak because I read your mind and I read your heart. Ana jalisu man dhakarani. This is the power of faith. This is the benefit of being faithful. No worries. You don't worry. If someone says, come to my town, I'm the mayor of that town. I'll take care of you. Then you are not going to worry about booking a hotel, renting a car, the food you eat, the places you go to. Because the mayor is going to receive you at the airport. You are guest of honor. In this life, all of us are guest of honor of God. All of us. But sometimes we don't realize Sometimes we put our trust in a human being, but we don't put our trust in God. Faith means put your trust in God. God the merciful who sustained you from day one, who took care of you, is not going to let you go. He's not going to betray you. And then they say, the same survey says, that the positive experiences are on decline within many countries. And they say that what are the positive, what are the positive experiences? They give several, several examples. One of them is the smiling and laughing a lot. This is a positive experience. One of them is when you are either learning something interesting or doing something interesting in your life. This will give you a positive experience. One of them is when you are treated with honor and respect by people around you. This is also will infuse you with energy. You'll be happy. And these are found in religion. These are the fundamentals of our religion. God says the benefit of faith is to make your life purposeful, full of purpose, full of meaning. So when you are, when you are faithful, when you are observ observant of faith, 
You don't find vacuum here. There is no vacuum in your heart. لا تسعني أرضي وسمائي ولكن يسعني قلب عبدي المؤمن. God says, I did not choose any palace to live in. This universe cannot contain me. It's too small for me. The only place where, where I can be contained, I can live in that place, is the heart of my believer, my servant, Abdi al-Mu'min, the one who believes in me. قَلْبُكَ حَرَمُ اللَّهِ فَلَا تُسْكِنْ حَرَمَ اللَّهِ غَيْرَ اللَّهِ It is your heart, the sanctuary of God. So don't place, don't lodge in your heart other than God. Keep it safe for God. Keep that room. I know some mothers, they love some of their children. They have a room at home. Though the son is not there, he's traveling, but she says, this is my son's room. I leave it empty for him. I leave it ready for him whenever he comes. This is my son's room. We have to leave a room for God in our hearts. Today, because... We are overwhelmed with materialism. I'm going to speak about materialism tomorrow when I speak about how to prevent divorce and separation. One of the points that I'm going to address tomorrow, inshallah, the night of Qasim alayhi salam, the eighth, is the effect of materialism on our life. People in the West, they reach the pinnacle of materialism. But on the other hand, on the other hand, they, they missed peace. They are lacking peace and, and stability in their life. So now, my friends, beside God, beside religion, beside Quran and prayers and fasting and dua and Quran and dhikr and remembrance of God, what can we do ourselves to bring stability and peace to our communities and our societies? What are the steps taken? I'm going to mention three points. These points are necessary to achieve stability in our communities, in our families, to enjoy this life. God wants us to enjoy this life. God is against suffering. God is against pain. God does not enjoy and thrive when we, when, when we live in pain. It hurts him. But it is us who inflict pain on ourselves, not God. God says, whatever goodness you have is from me. وَمَا بِكُمْ مِنْ نِعْمَةٍ فَمِنَ اللَّهِ But if there is hardship, it's not me. It's like a father who says, I'm, I made myself available to serve my family, my children. I am providing them with everything. So they should live happy. If they are not happy, it's not because of me. I lived up to my responsibility. It's because of them, their misconduct. We do exactly the same with God. God made everything available. God had showed us the way for happiness, how to achieve happiness. It's not hiding. The way is very clear. God says this is the path for satisfaction, for content. If you follow it, you reach that. And this is not a fairy tale. I've seen some people who live in poverty, believe me. They are not prophets, neither messengers, nor apostles, nor they are servants of God. They live in poverty, but they are happy. I visited some families who live in a small house, small old house, but I found them to be the happiest people on earth. And I live in a city for the last 25 years where we have the richest people on earth and the biggest celebrities they live in that city and sometimes you pass by their mansions huge mansion but they tell you people here are divorced separated they don't live together the mansion looks very incredible from outside but from inside it's dark because the people of that mansion are unhappy so it's not all about money, believe me. Money is part of it. And sometimes money, sometimes money is going to work against us if we don't know how to handle it. Some people, they destroyed their lives with their own money because they did not know how to handle it. So what is the first step? 
towards achieving satisfaction, internal satisfaction, internal peace. Number one. Number one is engagement and participating in building your community. The more you produce, the more you dedicate yourself, the more you work for the betterment, for the welfare of your community, the happier you're going to become. The more you give to your community. There is a study that found out that those who dedicate their energy, their life, their time to serving others, to making others happy, they become happier in their life. Whereas those who don't do public work, every penny they collect is for themselves. They don't share it. They don't believe in the principle of sharing, in the principle of helping. They don't believe. They are mean. They are selfish. They think that they are the only people who live on this earth. They live the most miserable life. Yes, they could be very rich, but they are not happy. So the more you give, the more you feel sense of belonging, the more relief you get. Sometimes I had some friends doing food drive in California. They take food to the homeless people, to the shelters to feed them. So when they come back after four or five hours, when they finish this distributing this food, I asked them about their feeling. How do you feel? Young ones. They, see, they say, Sayyid, we are very happy. We are very satisfied. We did something positive. We lend a hand to the needy, to the poor, to the homeless. They go back home happy, energized, full of hope, full of energy. This is a theory in the Quran. Our Imams were the happiest. Our Imams, though they were persecuted, they were tortured, they were marginalized, some of them, but they were happy. They were happy because they dedicated their life to serve the humanity. Do you think Imam Hussein on the eve of Ashura was sad? He was depressed? Do you think the companions of Imam Hussein on the night of Ashura? They were cracking jokes. Look at the history. They were cracking jokes. There were laughter in the tents. So somebody said to them, you are cracking jokes. Tomorrow you're going to die. They said, of course we know. Because tomorrow is the Fawzul Azim, our martyrdom. Tomorrow we are fulfilling our mission in this life. We are leading a life of fulfillment. Our life is not empty. Our life is not vacuum. We are doing something positive in this life. We are the happiest person. The day you achieve something, you become happy. The day you help someone, you become happy. Try and see for yourself. And therefore, when the Prophet ﷺ came to the city of Medina and he established the first nucleus of his community, his ummah, he told people there, the Prophet was a psychologist too, he said to them, listen, if you want to lead a life of happiness, you have to share, you have to work together. You have to put your hands together to build this community. The first thing, the first project they produced was Masjid al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa They built the mosque. Each and every single member of that community was helping carrying the bricks, including the Prophet himself. Including the Prophet, including Amir al Mu'mineen. They were helping, they were working together. A society where part of it are working, small part, the rest, the largest part, are spectators, that is not a good society. Same thing here in your community. All of you have to produce, all of you have to work, even when it comes to donation, my friends. If you don't, if you can't give a thousand dollar, give a hundred. If you can't give a hundred, give ten dollars. If you can't give ten dollars, give one dollar. Give it with a pure heart, pure intention. But not giving is not an option. One of the things that we lack in the Muslim societies and Muslim countries, I'm not speaking about this community. Your community is good, alhamdulillah. 
By the way, you have to be thankful to God for having this Islamic center. And you have to be thankful to God for having the city of Halifax. I envy you. I envy you. I wish I can live here. Friendly people, smiling people. This is the essence. This is the beauty of life. It's to smile. It's to greet each other. It's to help each other. And I'm going to speak about this in the second point, inshallah. So one of the things that we lack in Muslim communities is the spirit of volunteerism. We don't have volunteers. I've been to some communities. I've seen people in their 80s. In their 80s. 80 years old, 85 years old, 86, 87 years old. They donate their time to help to serve sometimes at airports, sometimes at schools, orphanages, clinics, hospitals, streets, public places, volunteers. Even in the police force, I've seen sometimes some police patrols in California and the guy sitting behind the wheel is 80 years old. He can barely carry his gun, you know. He's carrying a gun, but he can barely use it. He's a volunteer. It's written on his vehicle, volunteer. Because he doesn't want to sit at home. He says, since I have energy, since I have life, why should I sit at home? Sitting at home makes you sick. I need to help my community. I have to pay back to this community who helped me. We need to pay back. We don't know how to pay back. Muslims are consumers. The only thing they know is just to take, but not to give back. And this is wrong. This is wrong. Muslim community cannot progress. If they are addicted only to be consumers, only just to take and exploit the system, they are not going to move forward. They are not going to present a beautiful image, a beautiful name, a beautiful character for their religion in these countries. We have to participate. We have to work. One time I visited a non-Muslim community. Let me say the name, no problem. The Mormon community in Utah, Salt Lake City. They took me to a place where all the people who were working there were volunteers. All of them. Nobody gets paid. Nobody of those people get paid. Nobody. And I see some people who are surgeons. They are surgeons. You know how much they make an hour a surgeon in this country, in North America? They make a lot. He volunteers his time to bake bread. Can you imagine? He's a surgeon. He's baking bread. And they put this bread together. They send it to communities, families who are poor and needy. Sometimes they send it overseas. Sometimes they send medicine, clothing overseas. And they are happy. This is a successful community. This is an Islamic principle. كُلُّكُمْ رَاعُ وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُولٌ عَنْ رَعِيَّتِهِ We have to get to work. We have to build together. Sometimes I travel to some communities. I find them successful. Why they are successful? Not because all of them are rich. Not because all of them are university graduates. No. But because they have this spirit of work, production. They work. They reach out to other communities around them. They build relationships. They build relationships with the government, with the local government, with the churches, with the interfaith, with their neighbors. So they are respected. And other times I travel to areas, people are rich, they don't have any excuse, they have enough time, but they don't build relationships. They don't have any relationships. They are failures. They are only unto themselves. They don't open up with others. I'm going to speak about that Layla to Tasa, inshallah, two nights from now. What is our role in this country? How can we achieve how can we help our religion in this country? What can we do in this country? Some of you followed the World Cup. Did you see when the 
Japanese team, they played and after they finished every game, what did they do? Hmm? The entire team and also the people who came from Japan to help them and support them. They cleaned the entire stadium. This is an Islamic act. This is an ethical act. This is what God loves. This is a successful nation. Speaking about success, this is a successful nation. Although many of them are rich. You know the living standards in Japan. It's very high. Japan is very expensive. Those people can make thousands of dollars a day. But he says, this is my duty. This is how they were raised. This is terbia. We Muslims should learn from that. This is how we build our societies. This is how we put an end to division and corruption. When we all of us get involved, all of us are volunteers. All of us are servants. Sayyidul qawmi khadimuhum. The master in the community is the servant at the same time. So this is number one. Number two, number two step to be a righteous citizen, to bring about stability and happiness and satisfaction to yourself and your community is to respect and embrace the idea of diversity and a pluralism, ta'addudiyya. Societies that do not believe in a pluralism, do not believe in multiplicity, do not believe in diversity, they are failing societies. Soci societies that are governed by racism, this group is first class citizen and that group is second class citizen and that one is third. We, we, we do have this, in Muslim countries we do have. Second class citizenship, first class citizenship. Have you heard in Canada you have first class and second class? You and the prime minister here are equal. Once you get your citizenship, you are a full citizen. But in some countries, even if they give you after 200 years, they give you a broken citizenship, you are a second class citizen. <laughs> this is racism. This is bigotry, ta'assub. Such societies are not going to be successful, believe me. They don't move forward. The rest of the world moves forward. Such backward societies that discriminate against its own citizens and its own people and, and against people who live there, they treat them miserably, are not going to move forward. Allah says, Ya ayyuhan nas, you are all first class in my eyes. You all have... First class citizenship. We don't divide you. There is no class system in Islam. There is no class system in Islam. Ya ayyuhan nasu inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu. We create you into tribes, into nations, not to divide yourselves into first class, second class, third class. To get to know each other, to get to help each other. So we have to fight discrimination. Sometimes I get invited to some communities. Let's say the Lebanese invite me. The in entire room is filled with Lebanese brothers and sisters, which is good, not too bad. Sometimes I get invited to Iraqi communities. 99.9% .9 of the people who are listening are Iraqis. Sometimes Afghanis, sometimes Iranians. You know why I enjoy here? Because of the diversity. Because the Afghan is sitting next to the Iranian, the Iranian next to the Lebanese, the Lebanese next to the Iraqis, next to the black, next to the white, next. This is the beauty of life. God created us into beautiful garden of different roses with different blossoms and different colors. You put this mosaic together, you find this a beautiful portrait, beautiful picture when it is colorful. God said, I made this nation, these nations colorful, different races, different cultures, different tastes. So you get to know each other, you enjoy each other. This is the beauty of this life. When you are together, maybe you speak different languages. Maybe the color of your skin is different. Maybe your families are different. But at the end of the day, you are equal. In the eyes of God, you are equal. You are helping each other. You are reaching out to each other. 
some of these marriages, intercultural marriages, are very successful. They support each other. They learn from each other. This is the beauty of this life. So we have to believe in the pluralism of our life. Pluralism when it comes to races. Ethnic diversity, ethnic pluralism. It's very important to learn from others, to respect others, to integrate with each others. No race. لا فضل عربي على أعجمي إلا بالتقوى. The Prophet kept reminding his community, O oh Arabs, O oh people of Quraysh, do not think you are better, superior to others. إلا بالتقوى. Once you have piety, piety and righteousness, then you are better in the eyes of God. God does not look at your identity, your nationality, your ethnicity, your color, what language you speak. He never looks at these things. He looks at your heart. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَنظُرُ إِلَىٰ صِوَرِكُمْ وَأَشْكَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ يَنظُرُ إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ He looks at your heart, your dedication. So no superiority or inferiority. إِلَّا بِالتَّقْوَىٰ Except with piety. Then we have the other type of diversity, which is religious diversity too. Though we are Muslims, though we are followers of Ahlul Bayt, but at the same time we have to respect others, whether the others are Sunnis, or the others are Ismailis, or Sufis, or they could be other religions too. They are Christians, they are Jews, they are Hindus, they are Buddhist. We have to respect them. Amir al-Mu'mineen has a golden rule. Nobody could produce this sentence other than Ali ibn Abi Talib All of you memorize this golden rules. What is it? فَإِنَّ النَّاسَ صِنْفَانْ إِمَّا أَخُلْ لَكَ فِي الدِّينَ أَوْ نَظِيرٌ لَكَ فِي الْخَلْقِ the people of the earth, they fall into two categories. Either they are your brethren in faith. If not, if they don't share faith with you, they are your equal and counterpart in a creation. So take them as friends. Don't look down upon them. If he has another religion, if he subscribes to other school. This is the beauty. Amir al muminin says to his governor in Basra, He says, فَلَا تَظْلِمْ لَا تَظْلِمْ أَهْلَ الْقِبْلَةِ وَلَا تَعْتَدِي عَلَىٰ أَهْلِ الذِّمَّةِ Neither abuse, neither abuse the Muslims, أَهْلُ الْقِبْلَةِ are the Muslims, nor abuse the non-Muslims, أَهْلِ الذِّمَّةِ Respect them, treat them well, treat them equally. So this is the second type of pluralism. Then we come to another type of a pluralism. There are many. And that is the difference of opinions. See my friends, even sometimes in your family, with your wife, with your children, with your sons and daughters, with your extended family members, you differ in your opi opinion. People have different opinions, different tastes, different tendencies. People are not equal. Sometimes you differ with your wife in the opinion, that does not mean that you have to coerce her to believe in what you believe. You differ with your friend. You don't have to force him. Tell him you must believe in this. No. Different of opinion. Give them the freedom of expression. Freedom of speech. Sometimes we differ with each other. When we differ with each other, that should not be a cause to fight with each other, to boycott each other, to accuse each other. Different in opinion, no problem. You have this opinion, I have that opinion. I give you freedom to express yourself, you also give me freedom to express myself. We don't have to fight. God created us into different brains, different tendencies. So we can express ourselves. There are some people who are like-mind thinking. Like-mindedness is good. But sometimes you don't learn from it. Sometimes you learn when, when there is a difference of opinion. 
in a difference of opinion, we learn a lot from people if we allow ourselves to listen to them. But if I think always I'm right and I want to impose my opinion on others and force them to follow me, then this, here comes the division. Here comes the weakness. Let's respect each other's opinion. And this is an Islamic principle. You know, who is the most despicable entity in this universe? Who is the lowest entity in this universe? Who is the lowest creature in this universe? Who is he? Huh? Tell me. I'm asking you. Tell me. Sisters, you tell me, please. Huh? Iblis, Satan, Ahsantu. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Satan is very wicked. But Satan one day said, God, I want to speak to you. Listen to my opinion. God did not shut his mouth. He said, okay, speak. Though God could, could have told him, listen, Iblis, you are Iblis. Nothing comes out of your mouth is good. Nothing. Shut your mouth. But he did not sh shut his mouth. He, gave you, he, tell, he tells him, I give you freedom of expression. Freedom to speak. I have a request. Honor my request. I will let you stay. This is a freedom of opinion we learned from God. Let's listen to others. Not always we are right. Sometimes we are right. Sometimes people are right. So let's listen. This is democracy. This is real democracy. When you allow people to express themselves, give them time, give them honor, give them dignity, listen to them, and then after that we can have discussion. You know, in Islam they teach us how to do wudu and ghusl and this and that, but they don't teach us adab al-ikhtilaf. One of the things that we must learn, beside learning wudu and salat and ghusl and these rituals, how to debate with each other, how to differ with each other. There is adab, there are manners. Even when you differ with each other, there are rules and regulations. Adab al-ikhtilaf. We have to learn adab al-ikhtilaf. We have to learn how to disagree with others. How to respect the etiquette of disagreeing with each other. So this is the second point. And my last point, how to create a harmonious society. My friends, what is the essence of religion? Is the prayers that we do the essence and the fasting or something else? Is the prayer the goal or the means? Which one? Means. So what is the goal then? See, God says in the Quran, I want you to fast 30 days. Kutiba alaykum as kama kutiba ala ladina min qablikum. For the sake of fasting, I want you to fast? No. Fasting is a means to get me to somewhere. It's the road, the path. So what is the, the goal? What is the end? لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So you, be, you become better people, more responsible, more pious, more righteous, more human being. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So this is the goal. This is the ultimate goal. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ To reach the level of humanity. To aspire to be a perfect human being. This is the goal. And one of the fundamentals of our faith, my friends, is to speak the truth and to adhere to honesty. To be an honest person in your life. This is the quaint essence of religion. To speak the truth. Imam al-Sadiq says, when you look at some community, don't judge them by the way they pray. Because sometimes they pray very well, but outside in the market they cheat on each other. Inside the mosque, they have a beautiful recitation, a beautiful Quran. Allahu Akbar! He raises his voice. But outside, he's willing to cheat for five bucks. He's willing to sell his faith for five dollars. لا تنظروا إلى صلاتهم وصيامهم ولكن انظروا إلى صدق الحديث وأداء 
amana. If you want to know th whether those people are religious or not, don't look at their fasting and their prayers because some people, this is a routine for them. He's used to fast. He's, he's used to pray five times a day. Look at them in the marketplace. Are they adhering to truth? Or they are defrauding? They are cheating? They are dishonest? Which one? If they are honest in their selling, in their dealing, when they sign a contract, they stand by their, that contract, they honor that signature, they honor it, then this is a good community. This is a good family. This is a good inv individual. The, he's a true Muslim. He's a true believer. صدق الحديث وأداء الأمان ليجزي الصادقين بصدقهم Allah says we give those who are truthful يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وكونوا مع الصادقين Always be with those who are truthful if you, if you want to be successful in this life then be with the truthful Unfortunately sometimes you go to certain places in the Muslim world you cannot trust any person there in the market. You can't do business with anyone in some Muslim countries. And some of us, we have to travel thousands of miles, leaving the Middle East, coming to Canada to do business here. Coming to America, to Europe to do business. Because we can't do business in Muslim countries. Because honesty is missing. Truth is missing. As I mentioned, 1,000 minarets they call for the Adhan, but when you go to the market, Islam is missing from the market. So if you want to bring peace and harmony to your society, begin with yourself. Begin with your family. Begin with your community. Try to promote the truth. I mentioned it during Friday prayers two days ago here. Amir al-Mu'mineen has a beautiful, beautiful saying about truth. He says, لا يذوق أحدكم حلاوة الإيمان حتى يؤثر الصدق حيث يضره على الكذب حيث ينفعه No one is going to taste the sweetness of faith until and unless he gives a preference to truth where the truth is going to hurt him if he says the truth over falsehood and lies even if lies are going to benefit him. You go to an interview, they ask you a question. If you speak the truth, you give a true answer, you're going to fail. They don't give you the job. But if you lie, they're going to give you the job. People will tell you, go and lie. But God says, no, don't lie. You rather lose that job, but you don't lose your honesty. You don't lose yourself. Look up, look, look up to me. I am the razzaq. I am the sustainer. Don't be greedy. Don't be desperate that... I don't get this job, I'm going to die. Speak the truth. Maybe you you're going to win a few things, a few dollars. You're going to profit. But in the long run, you're going to be a loser. You're going to lose yourself. What's the point if you win the whole world? Mada yanfa'ul insan. This is Jesus. Jesus says this in the Bible. What would benefit if a, a human being if he wins the entire world, but he loses himself? If they tell you the city of Halifax is yours, it's yours. You own it. But at the end of the day, you lose yourself. You lose your faith. You lose your honesty. It would not benefit you. For a number of days, you enjoy this life. We have another life ahead of us. Don't be like those kids when they take them to a theme park, when they bring them to Disneyland or Disney World, they think that they are there forever. They don't want to leave. No, guys, you got a ticket. The ticket says only 24 hours or maybe, you know, 16 hours. Then you have to go home. We are like kids. We think that we are here forever. God says no. You are here for some period of time. إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ عَدَدُ أَيَّامٍ Imam Ali says you are in this life for a number of days, not a number of years, a number of days. Be prepared for the next one. Work hard for the next one. One of the people who adhered to truth and honesty is Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas See, Banu Umayyah, they betrayed everything. 
The Prophet said, I'm going to leave behind my legacy, my family, my book, take care of them. But Banu Umayyah, they betrayed everything because they were dishonest. They were liars. You cannot trust a liar. You know what is the most important thing in a marriage today? If you want to summarize all the virtues in one sentence, in one word, in one term, what is the most important thing in a marriage? Trust. If trust is there, your marriage is going to be a golden marriage. If trust is missing, nothing can help, believe me. Nothing can help you out. When the trust is gone, it's gone. It's a broken. The Prophet said to his community, I want you to take care of two things. Kitab Allah wa itrati ahla bayti. Take care of them. Don't betray them. Banu Umayyah came and the first thing they did, they burned the Quran and they killed Ahlul Bayt. They betrayed both amana, both trusts, were destroyed and betrayed. And the covenant was broken, was breached by Bani Umayyah. On the other hand, look at Al-Abbas. Al-Abbas, he was young. He was 33 years old. He had a life ahead of him. He had a family. He had children. He could continue his enjoyment in this life. But he decided to go to, to, go to Karbala. On the night of Ashura, while he was guarding the camp of Imam Hussein in the dark, between him and death, only few hours. Only few hours. He saw something in the dark moving. So he said, who's there? The voice of his sister Zainab came. Ana ukhtuka Zainab. He said to her, my sister, Qarri was taqarri. Go to the tent while you are outside. She said to him, because I have something to share with you, a story. Ahbabtu an uhadithaka bi hadith. Do you have time to listen to me? He said, of course, my master, my leader, my sweetie Zainab, of course. You are my leader. I am your servant. Haddithini faqad hala waqtul hadith. Of course, I would enjoy your speech. I would enjoy your story. I'm waiting for this moment. So he wanted to disembark from his horse. She said, no, no, no. Wahadithuka wa anta ala matni jawadik aqarru li'ayni. I want you to ride your, for, your, your horse. Don't disembark. It's more peaceful. It's more, it's more assuring to me. So he, she said, I want to share this story. Probably you hear this story for the first time in your life. When our noble mother Fatima died, حَزُنَ عَلَيْهَا أَبُوْنَا أَمِيرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ حُزْنًا شَدِيدًا our father was a broken, he was shattered. He was sad for a long period of time for the departure of his sweetheart, his real partner, his real friend, Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. After 22, 23 years, one day he called his brother Aqil, wa kana arifan bi ansab al Arab. He knew the tribes of the Arab community, he knew their families very well. He said to him, اخطب لي امرأة ولدتها الفحولة من العرب I want you to go and ask for the hand of a lady that comes from the house of chivalry magnanimity a house of courage a house of manhood a house of bravery a house of loyalty so Aqil went and he asked, Ya Abbas, he asked for your mother's hand, Fatima al-Kilabiya alayhi salam. Aqil said to Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, wa ma tasna'u biha? What do you want to do with this wife that comes from a brave family? He said, لِأُرْزَقَ مِنْهَا وَلَدًا أَدَّخِرُهُ لِيَوْمِ الشِّدَّةِ So I can beget of her a son, I can reserve him to the day of distress, the day of need. Then she tells him, Ya Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, look at this camp. Al-banatu banatuk, wal-akhawatu akhawatuk, fala tuqassur fi nusrati akhik. This is the family of your brother Hussein because you have been preordained for this day. You have been designed for this day. Our father, Amir al-Mu'mineen, wanted you for this day 
to stand with his brother Hussein to support him, to defend him. He said to her, Oh, my master Zainab, of course, I would not let you down. Of course, I will give my blood and my life to defend this camp and to defend this truth. Therefore, on the day of Ashura, Al Abbas could not stand anymore. Each time he comes, is seeking permission from Hussein. Imam Hussein says to him, Akhi Abel Fadl, أنت قائد لوائي والعلامة من عسكري إن ذهبت سقط لوائي وتفرق عسكري You are the standard bearer You are the one that puts the army together You are the leader If you go and get killed My army is going to be dispersed and dismantled So stay here Until a time that Abu Al-Fadl came He said يا سيدي أبا عبد الله I can't wait anymore I have to go. Imam Hussein said, then if you are determined to go, فَطْلُبْ لِهَا الْأَطْفَالِ شَرْبَةً مِنَ الْمَاءِ Then go and bring them some water to drink. So he took the skin water container with him. He went to the bank of the Euphrates. They gathered around him. They did not allow him to go. But with his bravery, he was able to disperse them until he reached the bank of the Euphrates. His heart was very hot. Imam al-Sadiq says his heart was very boiling out of thirst. So he took a handful of water to drink. All of a sudden he remembered that he gave a promise to Sukaina, to Ruqayya, to Rabab, to Zainab, to his master Hussein to bring them water. He let the water go. He did not drink. And he said, Ya nafsumin ba'dil Husseini huni. Look at his magnanimity. He's thirsty. Two days with no water. He was able to drink that water, but he did not. He said, No, I don't I don't put myself before others. I do not put myself before the family of Hussein alayhi salam. يا نفس من بعد الحسين هوني وبعده لا كان أن تكوني هذا الحسين وارد المنوني وتشربين بارد المعين تالله ما هذا فعال ديني ولا فعال صادق اليقين خاض الماء بس هيأس ببردة ترس شفا يروي عطايا يا يا اشجب دايا يا تذكر لن اخوه حسين بعد بعد ذب الماي من كفه وتحسر ينادي وين ابو فاضل عضي ايدي عضي ايدي uh, he, he threw the water away. He did not drink. While he was returning with a skin water filled with water, they laid, they laid behind the tree for him. They severed his right arm, his left arm. Wallahi in qata'tumu yameeni inni uhami abadan andini. While he was standing there in the middle, he has no arms to fight. He has no water with him to take back to the tent. Suddenly one of them struck him with a pole on his head. At that moment he cried loud, Assalamu alayka ya akha, ya aba abdillah. Nas'aluk Allahumma wa nad'uk. Bismik al-azim al-a'zam al-a'az al-ajal al-akram ya Allah. اللهم من على مرضانا بالشفاء والعافية اللهم وحد كلمة المسلمين على الخير والبر والصلاح والتقوى يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم اغفر ذنوبنا واستر عيوبنا وشاف مرضانا وارحم موتانا وألف بين قلوبنا ولا تحرمنا من نعمة ولاية أهل البيت اجعلنا في الدنيا معهم 
وفي الآخرة ننال شفاعتهم يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم لا تخرجنا من الدنيا حتى ترضى عنا اللهم أمتنا على ولاية أمير المؤمنين اللهم لا تفرق بيننا وبين الحسين وبين آل الحسين وآل رسول الله طرفة عين أبدا تقبل منا هذا اليسير ومن المؤسسين والحاضرين والعاملين بأحسن القبول وعجل في فرج إمامنا وقائدنا وسيدنا صاحب العصر والزمان وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات ثواب الفاتحة مع الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد